Chapter Fourteen of Mary, a Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by April Gonzalez. Chapter Fourteen. The Portuguese are certainly the most uncivilized nation in Europe. Doctor Johnson would have said, "They have the least mind, and can such serve the Creator in spirit and in truth." No, the gross ritual of Romish ceremonies is all they can comprehend. They can do penance, but not conquer their revenge or lust. Religion or love has never humanized the heart. They want a vital part. The mere body worships. Taste is unknown. Gothic finery and unnatural decorations, which they term ornaments, are conspicuous in the churches and dress. The reverence for mental excellence is only to be found in a Polish nation. Could the contemplation of such a people gratify Mary's heart? No, she turned disgusted from her prospects, turned to a man of refinement. Henry had some time ill and low-spirited. Mary would have been attentive to any one in that situation, but to him she was particularly so. She thought herself bound in gratitude, on account of his constant endeavours to amuse Anne, and prevent her dwelling on the dreary prospect before her which sometimes she could not help anticipating with a kind of quiet despair. She found some excuse for going more frequently into the room they all met in. Nay, she avowed her desire to amuse him, I felt to read to him, and tried to draw him into amusing conversations, and when she was full of these little schemes, she looked at him with a degree of tenderness that she was not conscious of. This divided attention was of use to her, and prevented her continually thinking of Anne, his fluctuating disorder often gave rise to false hopes. A trifling thing occurred now, which occasioned Mary some uneasiness. Her maid, a looking girl, had captivated the clerk of a neighbouring compting house. As the measure was an advantageous one, Mary could not raise an objection to it, though at this juncture it was very disagreeable to her to have a stranger about her person. However, the girl consented to the lady's marriage, as she had some affection for her mistress, and besides, Look forward to Anne's death as a time of harvest. Henry's illness was not alarming. It was rather pleasing, as it gave Mary an excuse to herself for showing him how much she was interested about him, and giving her the artless proofs of affection, which the purity of her heart made her never wish to restrain. The only visible return he made was an obvious to come and observe us. He would sometimes fix his eyes on her, and take them off, with a sigh that was coughed away or when he was leisurely walking into the room, and did not expect to see her, he would quicken his steps, and come up to her with eagerness to ask some trivial question. In the same style, he would try to detain her when he had nothing to say, or said nothing. Anne did not take notice of either his, or Mary's behaviour, nor did she suspect that he was a favourite, on any other account than his appearing neither well nor happy. She had often seen that when a person was unfortunate, Mary's pity might easily be mistaken for love. And, indeed, it was a temporary sensation of that kind. Such it was, why it was so, let others define, I cannot argue against instincts. As reason is cultivated in man, they are supposed to grow weaker, and this may have given rise to the assertion. That as judgment improves, genius evaporates. End of chapter 14